Welcome to Civility Speaks with Robert Sachs. This edition I'm calling Breaking Bread and Building Bonds. It's all about eating, which you may think is a strange topic for civility, but um, it's pretty important. Before 2020, the rough estimate was that the average American ate six out of ten meals out of the house. And if they did eat at home, they ate in their room, they grazed, uh, they picked and choosed. Very rarely did they sit down with other members of their family. Maybe they did while sitting in front of a TV. But the idea of um, sort of like uh, cooking a meal together or all the things that have to do with mealtime um, have become more important during this pandemic. Suddenly what was lost or considered out of fashion or kitsch or pointless is now emerging as necessary skills for interaction because we're all in this together and we're all much more sequestered and at home with each other, having to deal with each other in ways that are kind of um, how it used to be, but sort of unexpected right now in terms of our modern living. There is a whole section of Washington's The Rule of Civility that are devoted to dining and eating. You might ask why. Well, when you consider the fact that during the time of Washington, there was very little artificial lighting. There were no mass transportation or easy means of just going 15, 20 miles to a restaurant or a, or a disco or a bowling alley or whatever. Uh, there were a lot of not many reasons for being out of the house after, uh, after dark. And so mealtime was a time when everybody came together and everybody basically, uh, I mean, all sorts of things in terms of food preparation, in terms of, of sitting down with each other, in terms of saying prayers with each other, in terms of having conversation about the day or what the next days may be is something that was very, very much a part of a very important aspect of the social fabric of the time, pretty much everywhere, actually, during that time period. Now, the thing is that some of what I'm going to share here, like I said, may seem kitsch, may seem kind of like, well, why is that important? I think what's amazing about uh, looking at these rules of civility, again, written in the 1600s, okay, that somehow they do stand the test of time that when you actually begin to use these within the context of having a meal with people, they actually make a difference. They actually create not only a sense of decorum or whatever, but they literally make it so that um, conversing and in some ways kind of just enjoying the meal becomes easier. Now, realize this. I'm not going to talk about in this um, meat versus no meat, whether you should be vegan or vegetarian or a pescatarian or, uh, you know, an omnivore or whatever it is. That's completely irrelevant, okay? as is the conversation about organic versus non-organic. These are issues. They're social, they're political, they're issues around civility. They do matter, and probably over the course of me doing these podcasts, I will go through some of those. But at the same time, I'd say the most important aspect of what I want to stress in this is the importance of gratitude an attitude of gratitude around eating. 
you think about the idea of um, uh, the car uh, commercials that say, I feel full, you know, the kind of advertisements that you see about people celebrating being uh, swelling and gorging and filling their bellies to extremes. And this being a sense of satisfaction when, in fact, you all you have to do is turn on the TV and look at the news or read a newspaper from out of the country or some other newspaper that isn't just about entertainment. And suddenly you begin to find out how food insecure people are and that that is growing. So beyond gratitude, I, what I'd like to suggest is that you consider donating to food banks and supporting the efforts in helping those people who have a hard time even getting the meals that they absolutely need to be able to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. With those two things being said, an attitude of gratitude and a willingness to extend oneself, I'd like to go into these, these rules that Washington lived by. And again, I'll read them in the vernacular that he uh, wrote them down from this book that he got them from Francis Hawkins' book. But then I'll give you the commentaries that I have. And again, this is from my book, The Path of Civility, which is available during this holiday time and even after the holiday time. Rule number 90. Sit at meat, scratch not, neither spit, cough, or blow your nose, except there's a necessity for it. Basically, what we're looking at is things that have to do with your mouth and the way and with you ingest things is... Um, don't be a pig. Uh, don't be inappropriate in terms of these things. Oftentimes, this kind of sense of relaxed attitudes that we have usually just bespeak an attitude of poor breeding uh, or, or an attitude that in some ways shows a sense of disrespect to the people that we're around. So it doesn't mean that these are things are not necessary. And it says, if they are necessity, you do them. But you do them in a way which is not kind of like just um, in a kind of casual way that makes it seem like you're disregarding the people that are in front of you. Number 91, make no show of taking great delight in your victuals. Feed not with greediness. Cut your bread with a knife. Lean not on the table, neither find fault with what you eat. In these modern times when many people eat out, snack, or graze more frequently than actually sit down with others to break bread in any formal or familial way, the social graces of healthy, respectable, and gracious dining are all but lost. And yet business luncheons and luncheons, lunches are not infrequent as part of commerce, conversing over deals, Thus the manners and mindfulness of eating bear paying attention to as one more avenue in which one demonstrates a civil approach to an important human function and venue of social discourse. One of the actually earlier in terms of the rules of civility, they talk about not eating while on the street. I was reminded by my wife Melanie that actually her father used to be very adamant about not stepping onto the street while you're eating or walking around just noshing on food, okay? We think about it as something we would just do, you know, like just, you know, we drink our cups of coffee, we, you know, go to whatever store and pick up a hot dog or we eat a sandwich while we're driving. Well, the driving is more of a private space, so to speak, but just being out on the street and even the idea of eating street food what an interesting concept of eating street food. And yet at the same time, I would like to suggest how awkward people oftentimes feel when you're sitting. I mean, we uh, the, the town that we live in, San Luis Obispo, has a farmer's market or did until this particular time period. And people would eat in the street, but oftentimes people try to huddle around and don't necessarily display themselves as if they know that that kind of display is just in some ways kind of uh, uncomfortable. Number 92, 
Take no salt or cut bread with your knife greasy. More than likely, this rule has to do with hygiene than it does about using implements that are definitely yours by their use and applying them to what is commonly shared. It may be considered not unlike an animal tagging something for themselves. So the idea is, you know, um, what is yours is yours. Your fork is your fork. Your knife is your knife. And the idea of taking that and using that for what is commonly being shared is just in some ways, um, although the family may feel like it's okay or they don't mind it, it's interestingly enough the idea that energetically we do have responses, okay? What you'll notice is oftentimes your rational mind says, oh, that's okay, but there's your energetic mind, and your energetic mind goes, ooh, you know, has a bit of a cringe, and then you go, oh, it really doesn't matter. And the answer is that little bit of a cringe actually puts a little bit more acid in your digestive system, makes your food a little less digestible. Entertaining anyone at the table, it is decent to present them with meat. Undertake not to help others undesired by the master. Now that's, that's an interesting one. From the standpoint of who do you invite to your table? Sometimes what it is, is that, you know, you have a friend, but you know that there's an uncomfortable feeling when that friend is there. Maybe you wish it wasn't there. But the idea of trying to inflict someone into that social setting, unless it is agreed upon, in which case, hopefully, there's a quality of decorum or way in which people negotiate that situation. But to have someone uninvited just kind of pop in, although it seems like it is um, such a simple thing to do, and why should you think about it, actually can make it so that people find themselves feeling off in being able to eat and feel comfortable while they are eating. And certainly if someone is kind of disagreeable, and it is known that they are disagreeable, now is not the time. During eating is not the time to try and sort of like sort that out. Perhaps there are situations like uh, diplomatic meals where breaking bread is really important, but there should be some understanding that that is what is going on as opposed to making it so that it's just kind of a surprise. If you soak bread in the sauce, let it be no more than what you can put in your mouth at a time. And blow not your broth at a table, but stay still until it cools of itself. Commentary. If you soak more than one mouthful, you'll be holding a drippy piece of bread. Regarding hot soups or broths, those of manners learn that if you scoop along the edge of the bowl, that's where it's coolest. And if you need to, you just wait a little bit, engage in conversation. But do something that doesn't make it so you have to kind of like pant or, you know, um, take a hot, you know, mouthful of soup. And then you're just sort of like watching your head explode as you're trying to not scald your tongue. Put not your meat to your mouth with your knife in your hand. Neither spit from the spoons of any fruit pie upon a dish nor cast anything under the table. Commentary. It would be interesting to learn when the idea of cutting one's meat or other food and putting down the knife, then using the fork to eat the other portion, began. It is now more common American country habit compared to the European style where both the fork and knife are employed. And if stones from pies with stone fruit cannot be put on a plate and you cannot toss them under the table, is it to be placed in a napkin? Good question. And not only that, how many people now make pies with uh, stone fruit in them? Mind you, there's, there are like uh, fruit compotes and things like that that still have um, stones or pits that you can put to the side. Again, the idea is spitting at the table or making something that is kind of really kind of messy. It's an interesting idea that can you 
create a dining situation? Can you create a dining situation where you're really um, allowing yourself just to sort of like keep the space um, still, keeping the space as neat as possible? Okay, the use of napkins, you know, serviettes. Interesting, the idea of even serviettes. It's unbecoming to scoop or stoop much to one's meat. Keep your fingers clean and then foul wipe them on the corner of your table napkin. A healthier upright posture shows breeding, improves digestion, and reduces the likelihood of messes or spills. So what you want to do is be able to sit up as opposed to stoop over. Try and sit in the most easy way as possible. Okay? Can you use a napkin? Okay? Rather than that kind of thing or however you want to be. I mean, that's the advantage of having serviettes or napkins at the table. Put not another bit into your mouth until the former be swallowed. Then not your morsels be too big for the jowls. The art of proper chewing is actually something which is really a bit of a science in an in, in oriental understanding of good digestion. The idea is that you, especially when you look at um, most food, the more you chew it, the more you get salivary amylase or tylen mixed in with your digestive juices, which makes things much more digestible. So the idea of chew, chew, swallow, um, actually what's interesting is you can eat small amounts of meat in a way which is much more quick than when you're eating grains and vegetables and fruits. Chewing them a little bit, getting some of that digestive juice into them makes it so that you'll find them actually be more digestible. Oftentimes when people complain about gas from eating more of a vegetarian meal, oh, I can't eat vegetables, it makes me get gassy. The reason is that you're used to eating meat. And so what happens is meat, you can chew, chew, and you swallow it because meat is mostly digested in the gut. Whereas salivary amylase or tylen, which is in your saliva, is what's necessary for uh, complex carbohydrates. Drink not nor talk with your mouth full, neither gaze about while you are drinking. Okay? Chances are, well, I mean, obviously what it is is swallowing properly. If you turn one direction or the other, <clears throat> Or if you make a lot of gestures with your face while you're drinking, there is a distinct possibility that you may spit up, <laughs> for one thing, but also it's a question of just letting things go in, let it actually, um, in some ways, um, pray, create greater lubrication for your throat, allowing you to swallow more easily, and it makes less noise. Cleanse not your teeth with a tablecloth, napkin, fork, or knife, but if others do it, let it be done without a peep to them. So in other words, if you see people doing what look like obnoxious habits, I mean, it's very interesting. In, in, uh, in, uh, I've seen this in uh, mostly Asian cultures, but I'm sure I'm probably is something that is not that uncommon where people may take their hand like this and then they get a toothpick and they would, might pick their teeth if, let's say there's some really nasty stuff which is stuck between their teeth, they actually do it so that you don't have to see that. Again, the idea is how do you create a more beautiful dining experience for folks? Rinse not your mouth in the presence of others. Okay, so the idea of like swishing your mouth, okay? If you want to drink, that's one thing, but the idea of swilling or swishing is something which is much better done in terms of the way in which you clean your palate uh, later on, rather than it being something that you just kind of do in terms of swishing back and forth. It might be funny for a kid, but for anybody that's trying to uh, demonstrate manners at a table, it looks kind of silly. It is out of use to call upon the company often to eat, nor need you drink to others every time you every time you drink. So the idea is here that um, toasting people can be a very, very nice thing to do. Somebody that is new to the table, somebody you want to make feel comfortable. 
you know, if you have, or if you have toasting as part of what you do, to celebrate someone that has just come or is visiting is a very, very nice gesture. But then again, uh, what Washington is saying here is don't make it a, don't make it so that it is an absolute necessity or formality uh, just because someone is at the table that you have to toast everyone. I mean, there's certain levels of decorum in terms of various people <clears throat> that you're supposed to toast. But that is a different situation. In the company of your betters, be not longer needing than they are. Lay not your arm, but only your hand upon the table. So again, the idea of parents and, uh, and, and elders telling you to keep your elbows off the table. Some of, I think, some of what that is, is having your elbow on the table um, energetically is almost like um, uh, a little bit more aggressive. Like you could reach over or you could do something which is more aggressive at the table as opposed to your hands just being on the table, which means uh, essentially everybody is um, disarmed, so to speak. Nobody is trying to take advantage of anybody else. No one is taking advantage with respect of just making it so that it is um, uh, considered just be too uh, leisurely or too or an attitude of disregard when you have your elbows that are like that but also a sense of of really um showing respect for the people that are there it belongs to the chiefest in company to have unfold his napkin and fall to meet first but he ought then to begin in time and dispatch with dexterity that the slowest may have time. So here, in terms of when there is maybe a, fa a sense of family, a sense of um, not necessarily a pecking order, but a signs, signs of respect, but also it can be leadership, a sign of true quality leader, patron or chiefest person is that they have a natural and or due consideration for everyone at the table so that no person feels lesser or embarrassed unduly, regardless of their standing. In terms of anger, I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to talk about how anger spoils a meal. Set not yourself at the upper of the table, but if it be your due, or that the master of the house will have it so, contend not, lest you should trouble the company. So in other words, there are times when, let's say someone... Um, is invited to the table, maybe even you, where what happens is a, uh, uh, an elder, a grandfather, a, a parent, or whatever wants you to sit closer up to have conversation with them. If that happens and there is a sense of deference that is in the room, okay, then just going along with that is a sign of respect, okay, rather than it being something where, you know, you, you know, you may feel awkward, but at the same time, when someone invites you to do that, okay, it's much better to allow yourself to go with that flow. Of course, there can always be jealousies and rumors and all sorts of things that may come in terms of families beginning to do something like that, or if you're in a situation where someone looks like they are in favor, but oftentimes those are issues to be dealt with later as opposed to in the particular situation. If others talk at the table, be attentive, but talk not with meat in your mouth. So the idea really is this, is that we should have gratitude for, for our meal situation. And every conversation that's at the table should really, in some ways, be put in the context of that gratitude. If we have conversation that has in the background a gratitude for actually just being there together, breaking bread, building bonds, if that is in the background of the conversation, then chances are whatever you talk about 
will be much more uplifting. And if you notice that it is not uplifting, if you notice that it causes some level of consternation or awkwardness, you have a reference point of gratitude to come back to, to make it so that at the end of the meal, you feel like what you've done is you've created an event which is nourishing for body, mind, and spirit, that is nourishing in terms of um, really feeling like this is a way in which you build a blood bond and a common cultural bond with those people you surround yourself with. This is a really important aspect of civility we are just getting back to. Okay, It is the holiday season, and oftentimes one of the reasons why holidays are so contentious is because of the fact that we don't do this breaking of bread as often as we used to. Perhaps we should, so that when we do, when we then come to these holidays, they'll be much more celebratory. So, enjoy your holiday, good appetite, and see you in 2021.